And now just coming into the top of the arena, if you look to your right front, you see somebody taking one hell of a risk. And this is a German half-track, a Hanna Mag 251. And these were used by Panzer Grenadiers. Now, Panzer Grenadiers, as opposed to ordinary Grenadiers, rocket-firing Typhoon or the American P-47 Thunderbolt. And to a lesser extent, Mustangs. That's uh, quiet, isn't it? Too quiet. Now, of course, at this stage of the war, apart from perhaps a few, few fanatics on either side, nobody particularly wants... Everybody knows the war's coming to end. The Allies know the war's coming to the end. Most of the Germans know it, too. Of course, they've been told all... Now, these are both units that advanced all the way from Normandy. Uh, on the left flank of the British attack, we have the Hampshire Regiment, and on the right flank, the East Yorkshire Regiment. Both these regiments are divisions on. Both of these attacked on D-Day itself, landed on D-Day itself from the 1st Airborne Reconnaissance Squadron. And you'll notice that they have the slightly different helmet without the rim and the denizen smock. In fact, we have three different British helmets out there. Uh, on the left of the Hampshire Regiment, you can see the ordinary standard Tommy helmet, the sick pole, very familiar from the First World War. And in the centre, the East Yorks are wearing the 1944 the Turtle Shell helmet, which I can tell you from experience is absolutely the worst helmet ever issued to any army at any time ever. You never see anybody much running without having to hold the damn thing on or it'll stun you. As I say, the parachutes on the right are wearing the rimless helmet, uh, which again is actually a copy of the German idea. You'll notice when you see them more close up, the German parachutes also have a rimless helmet although the crown is, is, is the same as the main helmet. The idea behind this of course, is that a helmet with a rim uh, can catch it from the rises from the parachute, so a smaller, more compact helmet was developed. Basically by cutting off the rim. Now, the British have managed to set up a fire for them, but they're not really advancing very much against this German fire. British, you can see, are armed with the Enfield rifle, which is the number four elite Enfield. And the number four, the Lee Enfield, actually the best bolt action weapon of World War II. A ten round magazine, a very good bolt action, very fast, compared with the German Mauser, which has only five rounds in the magazine, and a rather long bolt action, it's much slower. So, bolt action to bolt action, the British have the advantage over the Germans. Unfortunately, the Germans don't seem to have any artillery, and the British have got two. Now, we can see that the uh, German force of Jaeger have gradually started moving forward. I told you these were aggressive troops. They're not just going to sit still and take it. They're moving forward to close the, the gap on the British. And you can just see there the other fierce... This is the one you they call the Spandau in the books. It's a light machine gun, and in many respects, it's been the forerunner of every light machine gun since. Extremely high rate of fire, usually around about 900 to 1,000 rounds per minute on the uh, infantry roll, but capable of actually 12 or 1,300 in the anti-aircraft roll. have the uh, well-known Bren gun. This has a 30-round box magazine, a much slower rate of fire, but nevertheless a very strong, reliable weapon, and in fact a, a check. And when the Germans overran the uh, Czechoslovakia, in fact before the war, they took the pattern on and literally had a very, very similar machine gun. Just a different magazine, to, because the British round is rimmed and therefore has a curved magazine. The German box magazine was rimless, but was uh, square. 
Some of the other Germans, uh, apart from the standard Mauser rifle, also using the MP40, the machine pistol. Again, the one you see in all the movies. Failed to make any progress because of the equal weight of numbers against the Germans in defence. Uh, we can see now the British paratroopers are pulling back, having lost men for trying to move forward. Again, you can see one or two of the Brits. To relieve the, the German unit, which has just borne the brunt of all of this fighting, is a unit of the Waffen SS. Again, they have a similar equipment to the army, but many of them you'll see have a uh, different camouflage, the, uh, the spotty camouflage, as we call it. Now, the Waffen SS, that's the armed SS, and of course the Schutzstaffel SS originally was Hitler's bodyguards. And the uh, armed SS was developed from those because um, essentially Himmler, who, com who commanded the SS, wanted to have uh, an armed military unit. And so gradually the Waffen SS uh, expanded and became infamous, shall we say, as, as again a very, very effective force. You'll, you'll read lots of things. There's a certain amount of rivalry between the army and the SS. We also have some members of the 4th Infantry Division and most members of the 101st Airborne. Most American soldiers were armed with the M1 Garand, uh, the first self-loading rifle issued to uh, infantry, or indeed any troops. Eight rounds, and they come out as fast as you pull the trigger. And now going forward, we see them with a pole charge. Yes, I did, I did mention that uh, being in a bunker was, was a somewhat dangerous occupation. Knocking out bunkers is even more dangerous as the man with the pole charge. The pole charge is literally what it says. You can see there a wooden pole with a TNT on the end. But the uh, big red one have another idea. And if you can see the left flank, they're moving forward the flamethrower. And I think the crew of the bunker have seen that coming and decided they don't want to be heaven bound just yet. And in fact, that was the bazooka. A rather a miss on that one, gonna have another shot. Second one up, here we go. Ah, oh, that's more like it. That's more like it. If anybody is in there, it's head swinging now. And here they go forward now, covering with the flamethrower. The biggest flamethrower map is pretty dangerous as well. Everybody wants a piece of you on the other side. Now we see more infantry moving forward under supporting fire from the BAR, the Browning Automatic Rifle, and the Browning 30 caliber machine gun you see on the right flank. Also a good number of them with the famous Tommy gun, 5 calibre. Both the British and the Germans have a 9mm, which is a 38 calibre equivalent. The Americans, of course, have to go one better with a 45 calibre. This is a fearsome weapon. You take a hit from one of those anywhere and it's all over. And the BAR gun again moving forward. In World War II, as tactics developed, the machine gun became very much the preeminent weapon. And the, and the Browning, which is a single, a single uh, part weapon, as opposed to the, the, uh, the Browning machine gun, which you see has got a separate base plate, meant, that, of course, that you could move forward much more rapidly. And again, the uh, BAR, the Browning automatic rifle, has stuck those Germans. And now they're loading up the Browning feather cannon. This is melt fed, of course, and say, being a two-parter, it's not quite so uh, handy to carry. Now, they appear to have uh, almost closed the gap now. They're up, they've taken the pillbox. They're not making too much more headway. They've taken a lot of casualties trying to get past the pillbox.
to try and get into that over on the German left flank, virtually playing across the front of the Americans. As they try to come round that pillbox, he's picking them off. And there goes the medic forward. behind pillboxes. Is it possible to turn them round and bring them back? So here again, here come the German infantry and the Forge of Jaeger. And again, the balance swings back towards the German forces. A lot more firepower now coming up on the German side. The Germans are now concentrating on their right flank, which is just as well because all the uh, artillery is going in behind them. here, but they appear to have won the day. <laughs> no, that, they, uh, they're a bit lucky there, they managed to take the, maybe some coffee, who knows. Now what you see in front of you is an M8 armoured car. And he has both a main gun and a heavy machine gun. These are troops of second armoured, well on wheels. And backing them up is a copy, if you like, of the principle of the German Hanemag half tank. Works exactly the same principle, but that's a much simpler trap mechanism. And now the infantry are piling out. This is exactly the role of the half track to deliver the infantry into the fighting position. In, in itself, it's not a fighting vehicle, although of course it is armed with machine guns. And now we have fire from the armoured car. And he appears to have a jam on the machine gun and the half track, but that's going to put a lot of firepower down. hundreds of yards in, in the case of a large one and maybe 15 to 60 yards in the case of a smaller shell. Not good news. You don't want to be near one of those. And that does seem to have taken some of the heat out of the German resistance. The Americans are now able to move forward with the firepower from the armour. Most of the Germans seem to be conducting a fairly orderly withdrawal under the defensive fire of the machine guns. On the right, starts to move forward. The armored half track is moving. Sorry, the armored car is moving forward to give them some cover. Interesting. They're still trying to take it out with grenades, and here comes the half track at the same time, trying to give some armor to hide behind, and of course some fire support. The more you can move the fire support forward, the more accurate it's going to be. And taking advantage of this again, the American infantry are closing up. Now they've reached the farmhouse. Now, 
Right, we see the, uh, the, the German NCO there, the SS NCO moving forward to try and move his men back. Well, the uh, Germans now in the city of this farmhouse have surrendered. A few more have made a, a reasonable escape. And we have some very relieved American prisoners from the Big Red One who have been rescued. Most of them safely, it seems. And we hope you've enjoyed it. If you'd like to come and see some of the equipment and meet some of the people involved, we're right over at the back. <laughs> so, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, that's all the... Uh, I know that the sugar with the...